Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Afikra Conversations. Our special guest is Professor Gilbert Ashar, who grew up in Lebanon, researched and taught in Beirut, Paris, and Berlin, and is currently a professor of development studies and international relations at SOAS, University of London. He's the author of many, many books that's been published in 15 languages, including the two books that we will be focusing on today, The People Want a Radical Exploration of the Arab Uprising and Morbid Symptoms, Relapse in the Arab Uprising, which came out in 2016, and then The People Want came out in 2013 with an updated version in 2022. Gilbert, if I may, welcome to Afikra Conversations. Thank you very much. Ahlan wa So let's start a little bit um, about your sort of, um, your framework that you that you use to sort of understand the, the uh political landscape in the Arab world. Um, when did you first begin to uh, develop an interest in politics and political science and begin to think that you wanted to study it uh, more so than the average guy on the street? Because growing up in Lebanon, everyone is interested in politics, and but very few decide, okay, I actually want to study this and uh, take this seriously. All right. Well, uh, that goes back... Uh... Uh, uh, I mean, for uh, to to my my youth, my, and that means a lot of time, even <laughs> age, because I'm part of the generation that was politicized by the 1967 war. I was at school at the time, but that was a very strong moment in my political awakening, I should say. I, I had started getting interested in politics even before that, but uh, this was a major, big, big turning point in the region. Um, and uh, yeah, my interest in politics uh, did not uh, fade out. I mean, I, 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 I thought of other, uh, maybe other uh, uh, other vocations at some time, uh, studying things which would not necessarily be politics, but uh, my interest in politics took over. And uh, that's how yeah, you know, I, I studied uh, uh, well philosophy and sociology, but uh, with a major interest in, in, in politics. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I ended up from the academic point of view, uh, being a professor, in, uh, I mean, teaching in, in a department of politics, of political science in France, and then uh, uh, becoming a professor in a department of development studies with the title of professor of development studies and international relations, which was trying to to point to these two dimensions, let's say my interest in the sociology of development and developing countries and all that, and my interest in international relations in particular as part of politics. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting <clears throat> when, when somebody, uh, at least in Lebanon, I was here during, um, throughout 2019 and 2020, the last few years, um, and those first few days during October 17th, when the sort of uh, folks went out to the ground and started complaining <clears throat> and uh, started the thought of the 2019 uh, protests, from afar, it didn't seem like it, it was about economics. But on the ground, it was very clearly about economics. And those who were here in the, um, in the months leading up to it, there were all, small little indications. There was the 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 wheat subsidy or uh, issue r rolling up to it, and so the the reason why I say all this is that it's not obvious, I think, to a lot of people how intertwined politics and political science and economics are. But um, most of in the beginning of your book, the uh, the people want so much of it is about the economics of these different places. Um, do you feel like when you talk about um, the political uprisings in the region that people are surprised that you spend so much time talking about the economics of, of the different states? Um, uh, that was the case, if you want, at the very beginning of what was called the Arab Spring, which was very much interpreted in the media and beyond the media, part of the academia even, as a purely political revolt for democracy, uh, 
liberation, emancipation, and the rest. Um, and uh, people were actually uh, uh, ignoring a major dimension of that, which in my view is even the, the most important dimension, which was the, the social economic roots of this discontent, of this huge discontent that translated into a wave of, uh, of, of uprising, a wave of protests, because I mean, there were in 2011, six major uprisings, but uh, uh, the whole region, so, or almost all the, the whole region, I mean, all major countries in the region, so uh, a big, uh, sharp rise in, in, in social protests and social and political protests. So the, uh, I mean, if, if you looked at, at, at that from the perspective of, uh, of uh, uh, trying to understand what was in common, what, what was the common de de denominator between these countries? Uh, well, to say that they were just for democracy uh, would be missing a major issue. And also it would be contradicted by the fact that, uh, uh, I mean, the uprisings and the level of protest were not proportionate to the level or degree of, of political oppression that you had in any country. Take Egypt uh, for that matter. Uh, it's obvious that the Mubarak regime was far from being the most oppressive uh, regime in the region. Um, so, so actually that was, I mean, uh, when you took a, a closer look as any scholar, any social scientist, uh, should uh, you, you you take a, a, a look at the uh, uh, historical um, foreground of, uh, of the, the, the historical background? Sorry, of uh, of what is happening, uh, you would see that, for instance, Tunisia, which is the country where everything started, as we know, uh, Tunisia had seen a number of regional uprisings on the issue of unemployment. Uh, in the years just preceding uh, the, the big explosion, which it's, itself was triggered by, okay, the, 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 the self-immolation by far of, of a young man, which was attributed to a matter of, of dignity in the political sense, confronting the, the police. But actually the, the, the matter is, if you look at the trajectory of this young man, you see that this young man is from a very modest, very poor background, that he was forced to stop his schooling at a young age and go into street vending, okay? And that's as a, as a street vendor that he was humiliated. So the, the social element was very clear. If you take Egypt, actually in the four or five years preceding the, the, the uprising, uh, it, it went into the most important uh, wave of worker strikes in its history, uh, including also attempts at a general strike, including youth movement like uh, uh, the, 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 the movement that uh, uh, to, 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 to which uh, Ala Abdel Fattah, for instance, belonged, and other people. The, 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 I'm here. Uh, pointing to a person who is on hunger strike and facing possible death today in Egypt. Very tragic case, uh, uh, by the way. But uh, these movements were about social issues. Uh, and even when the social issue was not uh, visible and the political one was more visible, uh, you would also see social uh, roots for that. Take Libya, for instance. On the face of it, it appears as a revolt against what was undoubtedly a very ugly dictatorship, I mean, which had been there since uh, 1969. I mean, Gaddafi has been in power, and that was terrible. Uh, but the fact that uh, the, the, the uprising, uh, the, the, the center of gravity of the uprising was in the, uh, 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 in the east of the country, in Benghazi, not in the west, was due to regional disparities and uh, the fact that the East was underprivileged part of, uh, of the country. And that's also, again, related to uh, social economic issues. And we can yeah. carry on like this, but if you come to Lebanon, 
Well, the uprising, I mean, probably Lebanon is the clearest case of a directly economic uh, reason. Uh, the only thing that was common to uh, the people who went into the streets in 2019 in Lebanon uh, was the, 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 the discontent due to the economic uh, uh, situation, which started uh, collapsing in 2019. And you know that the, the trigger, just the, the, the spark that led to the uh, uh, explosion in Lebanon, was this uh, tax on uh, on uh, on the, the WhatsApp on the, the voice over uh, uh, internet uh, protocol uh, communication? So you can see that uh, I mean the the social economic issue is everywhere. Yeah. It is common to the region. Unemployment is massive. Uh, youth unemployment, in particular, uh, uh, polls. I mean, uh, surveys of young people show a huge proportions of young people wanting to emigrate. So they're losing faith, losing any hope about their countries and contemplating immigration and uh, leading to also those desperate attempts at migrate through the, the, the sea. Uh, yeah. Lebanon was not part of that, but recently Lebanon itself joined the, the fray, if I may say. So that's terrible. I want to uh, go back to something that you wrote in the 20, um, I guess the 2012 or 2013 edition of uh, The People Want. Um, you mentioned that you, 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 at that point, even in 2011, you knew that we were going into a protracted revolutionary process or a long-term revolutionary process. Um, let me step back a few years before uh, 2011. Did you in those years, as somebody who was keenly aware of what was happening in the region, did you think it's just a matter of time? This is happening any moment now. The 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 cauldron is boiling, and at any moment, this is going to overflow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, you, uh, I have. Uh, uh, I mean, people who who can uh, testify to this because uh, I started the. Uh, teaching a, a module on a call titled uh, Problems of Development in the Middle East and North Africa at SOAS when I joined SOAS in 2007-2008, my first academic year at SOAS. And uh, uh, at the end of, of uh, the, the, the module, I always uh, contemplated the, 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 the coming explosion and e even discussed who... Uh, which social groups, social forces would be the, the main actors of this uh, uh, coming uh, uh, explosion in the region. Now, of course, I could not uh, uh, imagine that it would take the shape it took in 2011. That was something that uh, was impossible to, to forecast. But uh, I, I was absolutely clear on the fact that the region is had actually reached the boiling point for some time uh, before 2011. And as I keep saying, the question was more, why did it take uh, take it so long to explode uh, rather than why did it explode? That should have been the question yeah. because the, the, the conditions were really uh, there, ripe for explosion uh, quite a long time before 2011. So um, the, the term the people want which is the name of the the first book? Um, for those who don't speak Arabic, um, can you clue can you clue us all in into why it's called the people want? Um, you mentioned this in the introduction, but if you'll um, humor me, what is this phrase and where did it come from? Well, it I mean, uh, since everything started in in uh, Tunisia, as you know, uh, I mean, uh, the 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 first uh, impulse came from. Uh, this uh, event that I mentioned, this young man uh, setting himself on, on fire in uh, central Tunisia, in an impoverished part of Tunisia, on the 17th of December 2010. And that led to uh, the uprising that will uh, manage in uh, early 2011, on the 14th of January, uh, to, to force the president to flee the country to the Saudi kingdom where he, he took refuge. Um, so the, the, 
uh, the, the Tunisians in their national anthem, they have this, uh, it's based on the poem by, by uh, the Tunisian poet uh, Abdul, uh, Abul Qasim al uh, as mentioned here on the slide. Uh, and uh, there's a very famous uh, line in the in the uh, in that poem in that anthem, which says, "Is a shab yoman arad al hayat." And if uh, if 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 the people uh, want li life someday, that's the, the way you can you could translate it. Fate will surely grant their wish. Their shackles will surely be shattered, and their night surely surely vanish. That's an attempt, my attempt at tr translating, rendering more or less uh, this. Um, so if the people want life someday, is something that uh, find an echo in the uh, slogan, uh, and meaning, yes, now we want them. The people want this or that. Uh, the people want uh, the, the, the most, of course, well-known version of that became the people want to overthrow the regime. Ashab Yurid Asqat al Nizam. And this is the, that was the most ubiquitous uh, uh, slogan of, uh, of the, uh, the, what was called the Arab Spring. And it remained a slogan that we would find again in 2019 and the second wave of uprisings that uh, happened uh, in that year. Okay, let's, uh, let's um, move over to the term Thawra. Uh, because you discuss this in the book, and it's an interesting idea um, worth sort of unpacking. What this term means and why you think you may uh, think that some people mis, uh, misuse it, maybe, or misunderstand what revolution is and what it might look like um, in, in reality on the ground. Yeah, well, that was a reference to... Uh... Uh, the uh, uh, discussion that you had uh, uh, during and after the Arab Spring about how to characterize it. And so you would have people would say, no, that is not a revolution. Um, a revolution would entail radical change of, of, uh, of structures and things like that. And therefore, this is not a revolution. Uh, this is uh, a revolt, uh, this is this or that. You, you had various theses about that. But uh, the point is that uh, uh, they were referring uh, to the discussion in Arabic and the use in Arabic of the term Thawra. But the issue is that, uh, uh, we, I mean, that's also, I would say, that uh, something that any any uh, person wanting to, 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 to study seriously an event should do, which is uh, to e examine the terms used in their language, uh, in the original language, not in, in the translation. So Thawra has been translated into revolution, but Thawra in Arabic uh, is more polyvalent. Thawra in Arabic m means can, can mean revolt, any kind of revolt, even if it doesn't succeed, actually, and can mean uh, a revolution uh, in the sense of a, a radical process of change. Um, and, uh, and therefore, this was a, let's say, um, the wrong discussion, at least for the Arabic, when it comes to Arabic. Uh, add to that that uh, uh, contesting the term revolution didn't make much sense because the revolutions are not necessarily successful. You know, there are a number of uh, events in history which are pointed to as revolutions which were not successful, which were, uh, which failed. Like, I don't know, uh, 1905 in Russia, you had a revolution which, uh, which failed, but it's called the Revolution of 1905. Uh, so even that is not a good, uh, good argument. The, 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 the key point is that when people are massively in the streets chanting, Ashab Yurid Ishat al Nizam, that is, the people want to overthrow the regime, if that is not a revolution, then what is? Okay, so it is a revolutionary. Uh, act. However, uh, 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 to, uh, to, I mean, in terms of, of the outcome of this, which was quite uneven among the Arab countries where you had major uprisings anyway, the key point was to understand that this was the first phase of 
a long-term revolutionary process. And I very much insisted on that from the very beginning, at the time when you had this uh, very short-term perception and expectation about what was going on, which was uh, uh, encapsulated in the formula Arab Spring. Spring is just a season, one you know, short uh, period of time uh, in historical uh, perspective. And that there were, you have these illusions that this will you know, be like uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the regimes in Eastern Europe, which spread over a couple of years, but led to to radical change in the, in the situation in, in the region. So that was a, a, a false expectation for the Arab countries where the kind of system that you have is a much uh, tougher, uh, much harder not to crack than, than what you had in Eastern Europe. You had, uh, uh, reg I mean, uh, regimes entrenched in, in uh, over decades in control, in full control, of uh, of uh, the the, the uh, repressive apparatuses uh, with ruling families that uh, became private owners of of uh, almost of these uh, apparatuses and uh, the belief that it would you know just take uh, demonstrations people gathering in uh, in uh, squares and then it will fall uh, the whole uh, uh, the, the 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 whole structure will fall. Not the ruler alone, but the whole system will fall. That the nizam, not the the the, the head of the nizam, yeah, the, the 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 system, not the head of it. Um, that was a uh, full illusion. It was very clear for me, and I was called a pessimist at the time because I was saying I was warning people against illusions in 2011. That is and explaining that, look, you need to arm yourself with patience because this will be a long-term process and very tough one, very difficult. So, uh, yeah. I have a question about that because that's how I feel. That's how I felt going into in 2019 in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. um, but what are, when the process is that long, give me some sort of indicator light as to are we moving forward? Are we moving backwards? What are the indicator lights that people should be well, looking at? Long-term revolutionary processes in history are not, you know, uh, unilinear uh, kind of uh, 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 curve uh, going up uh, steadily uh, and until it achieves victory. No. Revolutionary processes are a succession of phases of revolution and counter-revolution, of uprising and backlash. Uh, everything, uh, I mean, it's, it's a permanent uh, um, a process that goes on like this until either it reaches a positive outcome in achieving the change that is needed or else, if if this change is not achieved, if the crisis um, uh, is not uh, uh, solved, uh, then what you may have is a is a major civilization and collapse of of, of and uh, and uh, you know uh, degeneration of, of of the whole the whole condition uh, in in, uh, in in the country so, in the region. Yeah. So let me try to. Um... I say no, that back to you. just to to explain. Yeah. So you had you had uh, this uh, first uh, revolutionary phase, which was followed by a counter revolutionary phase, a phase of of reaction, a backlash uh, after uh, in twenty thirteen. The beginning of that was twenty thirteen, and I wrote the second book as a kind of. Uh, I mean, I, the the second book is dedicated to the analysis of this. Uh, uh, relapse or, or of the old regime, this uh, counter-revolutionary phase. But at the same time, it's end up with the same explanation that actually the, the, the deep crisis that led in the first place to the uprising has not been solved at all. If anything, it has become much worse. And therefore, there is no stability uh, uh, inside. Anyone expecting a return to the uh, reactionary stability, the repressive stability that existed in the decades prior to 2011 is deeply mistaken. 
the region entered into a long-term turmoil, and you can see it very clearly if you look at the region, what's happening today, and there will be further phases of, uh, of uprisings, further phases of counter-revolution uh, and the rest. And, and that's what, what we got. I mean, in, uh, in 2018, you had a big uh, mass movement in Jordan. In 2019, you had... Uh, and uh, a new wave of uh, of uprising starting from Sudan in December 2018, then uh, followed by Algeria, then uh, then Iraq, then Lebanon, uh, and actually uh, without I mean the COVID uh, crisis, the COVID pandemic was a major factor in uh, in in defeating the second wave because it, this was seized upon by the, the governments uh, in order to, to, to stop the, the demonstration, stop the, the mass movement and repress it. Uh, very clearly, for instance, in the case of, uh, of Algeria, that's what the military did. They, took the, they seized the opportunity of COVID. Uh, Lebanon, you, you were there, so you could see how COVID impacted the movement, because it became quite uh, difficult for people to go gather in the streets at a time when, when of lockdown and the rest. So, but I mean, the, the, the deep crisis is there. Nothing is solved. Lebanon is in deep crisis. Iraq is in deep crisis. Sudan is in deep crisis. All the countries that we mentioned, and these countries until now, those who went into major uprising, not to mention the rise of social protests in all the countries, but those who went into major uprising until now are 10 to 11, depending if you count Jordan or in it or not. That is more than half of the uh, of the, the, the countries, the, the region's states, and very much more than half the population, because the, the most populous states are involved, Egypt, uh, Algeria, Sudan, and the rest. So this is by all means, uh, a com I mean, a, 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 situa a, 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 a situation of crisis. Crisis is there. It's a very long-term thing and it would carry on. So it carry on and it, it, there is no end in sight unless you, you find you, there is some radical change. And this radical change, for this radical change to happen, you need new kinds of organization of the the constituency that can be that can make this uh, revolution happen that can uh, for for now we have only one relatively advanced example of uh, self organization by uh, the, the the young people in particular which is sudan which is why the the movement is continuing in sudan uh, because there they have uh, much more advanced ways of organization uh, at the at the grassroots level, uh, I mean the, the the young people there have uh, uh, built a remarkable grassroots horizontal organization, which is the the the, the driving force of of uh, the movement, and that's why the movement is continuing there. In the other countries, it will take time for the movement to to build up. Uh, but as I said, either this or or you 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 go into more and more of uh, of uh, what civilization I failure to, to call barbarism. I mean, okay, I mean, yeah. Let me ask you a question though about this. So, as a scholar of this who has a, a very wide and long view, um, it's hard for me to under it's hard for me to imagine what you're describing long term. It's hard for me to see the full horizon of what you're talking about when you're talking about. 250 million people living across these 12 places um, who are, who you may, as you said, it might come to like civilization failure essentially, right? Um, can you give me some historical precedent globally for this type of thing where it's saying, hey, this is a great example. You want to see how the story ends? This is how the story ends. No, oh, yeah. I mean, you have a lot of, uh, of, of examples. I mean, uh, when you 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 think of uh, of well, if you take a, a region, because we're speaking not of one country but of a region, right? If you you take uh, Europe's transition from uh, absolutism into a modern kind of uh, democratic systems, even if you take just uh, Western Europe or what's called Western Europe, which is which includes part of, of Central Europe, 
this was a process that went along over uh, quite a long time, which went into different countries, into different uh, 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 kinds of periods, which had also terrible setbacks, which uh, so even a time of reaction, if you take a country like Germany and you take the history of Germany from uh, from uh, uh, the, 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 the late 19th century or the early 20th century until uh, even just after uh, the, the Second World War, you would, you would see it absolutely tragic, right? Uh, because it went through Nazism, it went through wars, through defeats and all that. So, I mean, uh, historical processes are, are, are long and we are speaking of a whole part of the world again. That's not one country. Uh, so it, it's uh, even when you take one country, you think of the French Revolution, you know, the historians believe that, I mean, they discuss how to um, how, how to assess the the chronology, if you want, of the French Revolution. And a well-known thesis, which makes a lot of sense, is that actually it's a process that went over a century from uh, the seventeen. Uh, 89 uh, uh, revolution uh, until you had a stabilization with a, a kind of modern parliamentary system that only uh, happened in 1870. And in between, you had radicalization of the revolution, then uh, a setback, then uh, you got in, in the empire, which was a huge reversal. Then you had the old regime coming back, the restoration. Uh, um, uh, uh, then you had a new revolution in 1848, new French revolution, new proclamation of the Republic. And that was also defeated by the rise of the Second Empire. Uh, and it's only at the end of that, after also a major uh, workers uh, or uh, revolution, the Paris Commune in 1871, uh, it's only after that in 1875 that uh, France reaches a, a kind of stabilization over uh, a, a parliamentary regime that will carry on uh, uh, after that. So if you think of it, just one country, France, and it, I mean, over a century, you have a certain century of turmoil, of uh, revolutions, setbacks, revolutions, setbacks, uh, counter-revolution, and the rest until the change uh, in the, the, this whole change in structure happens. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, uh, you, you have to consider the, the, the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa, as from that perspective, that is uh, either you have this radical change happening, uh, uh, putting the, the, the region on a different track and back on the track of, of real development, uh, uh, going along with uh, democratization uh, and and the rest and and real modernization, uh, or else uh, you will have more and more tragedies. That's absolutely uh, yeah. Certain, in my view. It's almost like it should be called the Arab Autumn, the Arab Fall, which will uh, uh, quite naturally be followed by the Arab Winter, which is. Um, no, you... no, no. We went through the Arab winter. I mean, uh, the, the succession of seasons is uh, faster than what you are alluding to, because uh, you had a new spring. Huh? The, the 2019 was a second spring. It mm. was called the second Arab spring, even in the media. By oh, way. so you, your framework, you think that that the the. So what you're suggesting is that there are many revolutions that have to be keep on happening, happen. Uh, until there's some, at some point, there is either a complete decay and a complete degradation, or at some point, there's some click that happens, in which case a new paradigm emerges and there's a new framework entirely. Yes, exactly. And for this to happen, you need, as I said, you need uh, uh, an agency for the revolution, uh, for the, the, the youth in particular, that is up to the task, you know. Uh, and that's why I was saying uh, the most interesting de development in that regard is uh, what uh, what is going on in Sudan. Um, if uh, now they are uh, involved in a tug of war with the military, it is very difficult, obviously, uh, and uh, we can't bet on their success. But uh, they have not been defeated yet. That's already uh, very important. They are carrying on their fight. If ever they manage to, to succeed in, 
in, in overthrowing a military dictatorship and uh, really democratizing their country and, and uh, really imposing a change in, uh, in the social economic uh, policies and all that uh, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in for, toward, uh, toward more social justice, that would set such an important precedent for the whole region. This will have a huge impact. And uh, will need to, to will lead to to uh, uh, other people trying to to, uh, to 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 do the same in their countries. But until now, we haven't had a single uh, a positive model of success in the region, and uh, and that may be also demoralizing other people. Um, that's why also we have more and more of this youth migration, so people. Uh, feel resignation, feel that oh, uh, I'm not. I mean, we're not going to to be able to to change this uh, uh, very bad system. So let's uh, let's leave the country. Let's uh, let's change country. If I can't change my country, the alternative becomes I will change country. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so th- that's very um, unfortunate uh, that uh, this outcome is 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 now uh, taking uh, over, but it's definitely not that because, I mean, it's impossible for the whole population or even the whole young people to to, to, to leave that. that uh, and, and you see it is continuing. Take the, the worst, the absolutely by far the worst um, tragedy in the region, which is Syria. Well, e- I mean, even in those areas under control of the Syrian regime, we have seen in the last, even a couple of years, social uh, big social protest uh, in Dara, in Sweda, and other you have people revolting uh, about social economic issues and sometimes mm. about even political issues. So that shows you that this potential of revolt is still there uh, in all countries. Uh, take Egypt. Okay, uh, Sisi has uh, imposed himself with a very harsh uh, uh, repression. You have sixty thousand people uh, who are. Political prisoners, it's a huge. Um, uh, of course, most of them are Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood, but uh, not only. There are a lot of people like Ali Abdel Fattah, uh, whom I mentioned, like uh, you know, people who were representative of the youth movement that uh, made 2011. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, the, the, I mean, people have been demoralized by the, the coup, by the repression, but there, the, the discontent is absolutely simmering there. It's very obvious there. The social economic situation is untenable. And sooner or later, I can tell you, take my word for it, it will explode again. The problem for Egypt, for instance, as for other countries, is the lack of credible alternative. If people saw a credible alternative, like is the case in Sudan, that is, there is a credible alternative to the military, if, if that existed in other countries, you can be sure you would have now uprisings everywhere because people would want to fight for this alternative. But they don't see it. That's a problem. Uh, they try to, I mean, they don't want the Muslim Brotherhood. That's not the alternative. That's not the solution. That's part of the problem. They want a real, uh, a real change and they want uh, to see uh, credible agents of real change that they could support and bring to power. That's the that's yeah. problem. So when you're teaching your classes at SOAS, right, um, and there are students, you know, 19-year-olds from any one of these countries, right, who are, quote-unquote, one of the lucky ones, who are find themselves in London, working electricity, unlike what I have right now, um, working internet, somewhat, some type of nizam, um, and, they're, and they are studying with you. They are learning about the history of uh, political turmoil in the region about socioeconomic um, injustices and disparity. And they say to the professor, is there any, any hope right now in the, in the near term? Right now, I have uh, on the screen, for those who can't see the screen and are listening to the podcast later on, one of the quotes that you have in your second book, which is from Khalil Gibran, uh, from a letter that he wrote to Maizieh in 1920. And I'll read it. It says, yet in every winter's 
heart, there is a quivering sp spring. And behind the veil of each night, there's a, a smiling dawn. Thence did my despair turn into a form of hope. So have you found those hopeful moments? And do you try to communicate those hopeful moments? Or do you just say, take a deep breath, because you don't know how long you're going to be underwater? Um, there's no contradiction between what you, I mean, the two, uh, <laughs> what you present as an alternative. There's a, definitely no contradiction. You need to take a deep breath, definitely, but uh, 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 there is hope. It's not a hopeless situation. Um, uh, in what sense? I make a distinction, which I think is important to keep in mind, between hope and optimism, right? There is no room for optimism in the region. I say it very clearly. There is no room for optimism in the sense of the belief of the the the, the fad of uh, the, the belief in the positive outcome, the belief that uh, uh, we shall overcome, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is no room for such belief that is called optimism. Uh, if 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 you are speaking of any optimism in the region, it, it it would be only an optimism of the will according to the famous formula that says uh, that you should combine pessimism of the intellect with uh, optimism of the will. That's something I can agree with, but that means pessimism of the intellect. That means understanding that, as I was saying in 2011, when, when you had euphoria, you had real euphoria in 2011. And I was saying at the time, calm down, cool down. This is not going to be easy this is not going to be smooth, and this is not going to be brief. Now, this is only the beginning of, of the many, many years and actually many decades of, uh, of, of upheaval. Um, uh, uh, so I, I repeated the same after the setbacks of 2013. So in 2011, when I was saying that I was labeled as a, a pessimist, and in uh, in 20, after 2013, when I was saying the same, I was labeled as optimist. Uh, I became a pessimist, like uh, Emil Habibi's uh, famous uh, novel. <laughs> uh, uh, but the fact is that I'm neither that nor that. It's a, it's a matter of uh, assessing realistically what you have. And if you do that, you see how difficult it is. At the same time, hope is something else. It's not optimism. Hope is just the recognition of the existence of a potential. Hope means that I know there is a potential there and the, that leaves a margin for hope that is a possibility for change, a possibility for something uh, different. There is definitely no... Uh, um, uh, uh, guarantee, no, uh, um, no, nothing certain about the outcome. There is definitely not, but that goes both ways. It's uh, certainly uh, not uh, 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 um, predestined that uh, you would have uh, uh, a successful outcome of this big uh, uh, change process. At the same time, I would say it's not also uh, part of the necessary fate that it would fail. So there is this potential that exists the, 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 in the youth in particular, but uh, that's a potential that allows for hope. And if you don't have hope, you, you do, as I said, then you, you give up changing your country and you change country. But yeah. there is hope. Uh, there is a room for hope. And that allows people to fight, to deploy, if you want to get back to the formula, the optimism of the will, provided they keep the pessimism of the intellect. And that's important. But you can't have optimism of the will if you are hopeless. So yeah. you need hope. And hope is justified in the potential that exists. Okay, we have time for one quick question. Um, and it comes from Giselle. The question is, in your opinion, did the Arab Spring bring positive change to the region? Uh, the most important change that it brought, and that was the conclusion of my major book, uh, because of the two books that you mentioned, it's the people want, that is the, the basic one. The other one is just uh, uh, an analysis of a phase of that. 
But the people want, uh, that's why you had a, a new edition this year, uh, a few months ago, it came out of uh, the people want with a, uh, a new preface um, uh, in which I, I, I discussed the, the balance sheet of events since 2011 until, until, until now. Uh, uh, the, the, I finished that book by, by, by stressing the point that the major uh, uh, gain, if you want, the major achievement of the first phase, at least of that, is that the people has learned to want, and that's very important. You are speaking of a part of the world where you didn't have, you hardly had, uh, you know, big mass protests against uh, existing uh, regimes, uh, governments, or whatever. People were just, uh, I mean, the regimes were cultivating fear and keeping people uh, uh, down by, 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 by fear, by, by repression. And this was broken. And you have this new boldness in the region. You have uh, that allowed for a second wave of the uprising in 2019. And I, I can assure you, that you there will be others. I mean, uh, the, the region is actually, the, the explosive conditions are just building up, are just uh, worsening almost by the day in this part of the world. And therefore, uh, you, you, there. That's why I'm saying, the, the, if you want to predict what will happen, the only safe prediction you may do is that there won't be any state stabilization of the region for a very long time to come. That's the thing. Now, the rest will depend on the ability, as I said, and, and I repeat now, on the ability of uh, of uh, the, the the revolutionaries, if you want, uh, those who want to change their ability to build uh, uh, credible alternatives to the existing regimes. Oh, uh, I'm not hearing you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to go through this. Um, lots of heavy questions. I appreciate your, um, your hopeful pessimism, I should say. Um, <laughs> And That's as, a opposed good to, <laughs> as opposed to cautious optimism, hopeful pessimism, I appreciate that. Um, and especially because this topic is very rarely discussed um, in circles without calls for activism um, and without calls for any promotionalism. And what I appreciate so much about your work is that you're able to see it with a, with a clear eye um, and able to sort of diagnose uh, what's happening um, and allow people to come to their own conclusions for what they what they must or feel like they uh, might want to do. So thank you so much for uh, thank you. allowing me to ask thank a bunch you. of questions. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. And all okay, the everyone, this will show up on the podcast this week. Um, if you know anyone who would have liked to listen, you can share uh, widely. And we'll be back in two days with one of our movie night episodes. Bye-bye, everybody.